Today's episode examines a case involving a child under the age of 10 and includes discussion of violence and sexual assault, which may be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Five-year-old Justin Turner vanished on a Friday morning in March of 1989. Two days of searches organized and led by the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department turned up no trace of the missing child. Investigators began to theorize that the boy had been abducted while making his way to the bus stop until early on the third day when his body was discovered in a location that was supposed to have been searched already. The focus of the investigation turned from the possibility of a stranger to someone closer to home, namely his stepmother, Pamela. Following the conclusion of a coroner's inquest, an arrest warrant was issued. Two months later, the grand jury returned an indictment, charging her with the five-year-old's murder. Six months later, all charges were dropped, with the solicitor's office citing a lack of sufficient evidence to ensure a conviction. Disputes between investigators and the coroner's office were cited as hindering the case. Laws protecting spouses from testifying against one another were changed in response. A public battle between prosecutors and the sheriff came down to a debate about the weight of circumstantial evidence. 32 years later, Justin's case has fallen into the hands of cold case detectives who hope advances in forensic technology will finally unlock the evidence necessary to place a child killer behind bars. Has a new person of interest come into the case? Or do investigators remain focused in on the only person ever publicly named a suspect? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 171, The Murder of Justin Turner, Part 2. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we will conclude our examination into the horrifying murder of five-year-old Justin Turner. Before getting back into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. On a humid day beneath gathering storm clouds, the body of five-year-old Justin Turner was found in a spot that had supposedly been searched multiple times. What began as an investigation into a stranger abduction quickly became a case focused in sharply on Justin's own stepmother. This is episode 171, The Murder of Justin Turner, Part 2. On the morning of Friday, March 3rd, 1989, five-year-old Justin Lee Turner vanished. According to his stepmother, Pamela Turner, the last time she saw the child was just before 11 a.m. Justin attended half-day kindergarten classes at nearby Whitesville Elementary School. On most days, Pamela would accompany Justin to the bus stop several hundred yards from the door to his father's home on Horseshoe Road. However, on this particular day, Pamela was in the shower, and according to her statements to investigators, Justin popped in his head just to say that he was going to the bus stop, and she continued on with her shower. Neither the neighbor nor her grandchild, a good friend of Justin's, ever saw him that day. When the bus returned approximately four hours later to drop off the kids who had gone to school, Justin wasn't there. According to Pamela, she spoke to the bus driver who explained that Justin hadn't gotten on the bus that afternoon, and neighbors told her they hadn't seen him that day, assuming he was maybe sick and staying home. At 3.12 p.m., a 911 call came in to the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department to report the five-year-old missing. 
Several deputies were dispatched to the home to begin searching, while at the time, they were unsure if an abduction had taken place or if Justin might have gone off somewhere, perhaps to play, and missed the bus either on purpose or accidentally. According to Justin's biological mother, Elaine Pace, investigators first focused in on her. When Elaine divorced Justin's father, Victor Buddy Turner, it was far from amicable, and Buddy had received custody of Justin. At the time, Elaine was mounting a case to adjust the custody agreement, so it was initially theorized that she might have come and taken Justin. Elaine, however, was ruled out quickly when it was determined that both she and her new husband, Russell, were at work during the time Justin disappeared. Deputies reported that two full searches on the Turner home were conducted that first day, but no sign of the missing five-year-old was found. On the Turner's property, there was a small trailer, the type you would hook up to the back of a truck, and inside there was a dining area. One deputy claims to have thoroughly searched the trailer, finding no trace of Justin, though a polygraph test would later call that claim into question. Others, however, have stated that they witnessed or were present for searches of the trailer over the course of the next days. The search party for Justin initially consisted of law enforcement officers. However, as Friday came to an end, the group would grow. On Saturday, March 4th, the size of the group had doubled and included members of the fire department, search and rescue squads, family, and friends. Elaine's side of the family, though, has noted not only were they not allowed to participate in the searches, but they weren't even allowed to set foot on the Turner's property. By the morning of Sunday, March 5th, Justin's disappearance was statewide news, and the number of volunteers grew exponentially. The third day of searching began at approximately 8 a.m., with different groups being assigned different locations in the surrounding area. Much of the first searches had focused on the Turner property and that of neighbors, with several ponds being dragged, but no evidence was found. Strangely, less than 30 minutes after the search began, Buddy Turner stepped into the trailer and called out that he had found Justin. The five-year-old was deceased and had been placed inside a storage compartment accessible by removing the cushion of a seat in the dining area. This horrifying discovery led to a lot of confusion as no one could understand how Justin had been missed on previous searches, nor what had driven Buddy to search the trailer that morning, especially since the sheriff's department had previously told him that the trailer had been searched several times. Upon finding Justin, the area became a crime scene and it was locked down, but two days of previous searches had seen countless people, both strangers and family alike, walking through and moving things around. At the time, Justin's body was removed from the scene in hopes that an autopsy might provide some insight as to what happened. Simultaneously, Pamela and Buddy were questioned by investigators while other detectives questioned Elaine. According to investigators, Pamela told the same story she had on Friday, that the last time she'd seen Justin, he popped into the bathroom to tell her he was walking to the bus stop. The autopsy, conducted by Berkeley County Coroner William B. Smith Jr., determined that Justin had been the victim of a homicide, with his cause of death having been ruled due to strangulation. Disturbingly, in addition to murdering Justin, the assailant had also sexually assaulted the child by penetrating him with an unknown cylindrical object. Marks on Justin's neck suggested the little boy had been strangled by an unknown ligature, speculated to have been either a belt or dog leash. While police had initially taken the perspective that Justin had likely been abducted and removed from the area, the more evidence was discovered, the more the focus began to close in on Justin's father and stepmother, Buddy and Pamela. On Wednesday, March 8th, the couple were brought down to Columbia, the headquarters of the State Law Enforcement Division, or SLED. Each was taken in separate vehicles where they would be questioned for approximately four hours before being given polygraph tests. The test returned inconclusive results, though not due to any particular issue with the technology itself. Instead, investigators later testified that the couple had ingested a sedative, identified as Valium, prior to the tests, apparently in an attempt to skew the results. While both agreed to take tests again when they were not medicated, their lawyers didn't allow that to happen. 
Instead, an outside firm was hired and two representatives later testified that both Buddy and Pamela had passed their tests. Two coroner's inquests took place between August and December. The first was canceled on only the second day when Coroner Smith fell ill and had to be rushed to the hospital. The second inquest, which lasted for three days, saw 70 witnesses testify under subpoena. Buddy and Pamela did not attend the first two days of the inquest, possibly due to having moved homes and their notices being lost in the mail. During testimony, some investigators noted that the trailer had previously been searched, while others stated that they had looked in the trailer but had not conducted a thorough search. Disputes from both sides of the family were aired during the inquest, with accusations being thrown that Buddy and Pamela knew more about Justin's death than they were sharing with investigators. When the inquest ended, the six-person jury returned a verdict that Pamela Turner should be arrested and charged with Justin's murder. Coroner Smith swore out a warrant then and there, and Pamela was arrested in the Berkeley County Courthouse, being transferred to the county jail until a bail hearing could take place. Two months later, in February of 1990, following three days of testimony, a grand jury returned an indictment against Pamela. Ninth Circuit Deputy Solicitor Steve Davis was in charge of the case, and a trial was originally scheduled to begin in August. Pamela's lawyer, however, requested additional time to prepare his defense, and so the deputy solicitor agreed to move the trial into October, but it would never take place. On Tuesday, November 13th, Davis officially dropped all charges against Pamela, citing insufficient evidence. It was said at the time, both the solicitor's office and the family agreed that additional evidence was necessary to secure a guilty verdict, and no one wanted to risk losing out due to double jeopardy laws should new evidence be found later. While Pamela was free to go, Davis specified that the charges could be reinstated at any time, and she had not been ruled out as a suspect. Over the course of the next year, Justin's case would ebb and flow. Media coverage became spotty, and investigators noted that they believed they knew exactly who had killed the five-year-old. They merely lacked the evidence to file charges. However, that wasn't the whole story. Reportedly, there was a dispute between the sheriff's department and the office of the solicitor. While investigators wanted to make an arrest and allow a jury to decide for themselves, the solicitor's office did not intend to move forward with prosecution unless additional evidence could be found, specifically evidence that could tie Pamela directly to the murder. In January of 1991, nearly two years after Justin's murder, a story leaked to the media told a bizarre tale. A witness emerged who claimed to have not only been present the day Justin was abducted, but to have witnessed it. What made the story all the more strange was, according to investigators, they had been aware of this witness since nearly the first day of the investigation, and that is where we pick up the case today. The witness in the news story turned out to be a six-year-old boy who told his mother that he'd seen a man grabbing Justin and taking him to a nearby car on the morning he disappeared. Investigators were informed about this witness early on in the investigation, but it dismissed the eyewitness account after two out of three psychiatrists stated that the child had likely seen news stories about the case, and these had caused him to imagine the scenario. However, now nearly two years later, new Sheriff Ray Isgit was taking the account seriously, telling reporters that this witness was the key to unraveling the truth. According to the child's mother, even after all that time, her son was still too afraid to go outside and had been severely traumatized by what he'd seen. The mother also stated that in the days after Justin's body had been found, they'd received several anonymous calls from a male who had threatened both her and her son to keep their mouths shut. According to reports published in local papers, the boy told police that on the morning of Justin's disappearance, he saw Justin walk out of his family's home and head down the dirt driveway. He then witnessed an older male stand up from behind a large pile of dirt and call out to Justin, who walked towards him. Once Justin had gotten close enough, this man cupped his hand over his mouth and pulled him away. The witness described the man as having black hair, partially spiked, standing less than six feet two inches tall, 
and weighing more than 150 pounds. He described the vehicle as being a dull gray compact car. According to investigators, there were only ever able to track down one person who fit the description given by the child, and he was quickly ruled out as a suspect. When asked why they hadn't pressed further on the issue or dug deeper, investigators noted that they had been advised the witness had been severely traumatized by the incident and further inquiries might cause additional psychological damage. Psychiatrists also apparently stated that even if the child could handle the intense pressure of cooperating with the investigation, his testimony was unlikely to hold up in trial and he could not manage his way through a cross-examination and thus this lead fell by the wayside. In the end, investigators believed they already knew the truth and who was responsible. They just didn't have the evidence they needed to prove it. In May of 91, Sheriff Isgit, who had run on a platform that his office would solve Justin's case, made several statements to the media. He noted that physical evidence that had not yet been analyzed had been sent to the state crime lab to be examined, and it was his belief that an arrest would be made within six months. When asked about Pamela, Isgit would not say she was the prime suspect, nor would he rule her out though he did state that there is a suspect who is close to her. Earlier in the year, he had spoken with experts from the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, as well as a Canadian forensics expert, a member of Scotland Yard, and SLED agents. It was their united belief that Justin had likely been killed out of anger and frustration. Beyond that, Isgit stated that all parties involved agreed on who they believed was the killer and he also noted that they thought the killer had likely told at least one other person, who under state law, could be charged as an accessory after the fact. Sheriff Isgit said there was enough evidence for an arrest, but not yet enough for an open and shut case. Five months later, in October, Sheriff Isgit revealed that the piece of evidence which had been analyzed was a fiber recovered from Justin's body. This fiber, he said, helped rule out one potential suspect, but it also supported suspicions of another. Isgit also expressed frustration with the solicitor's office, who he felt could easily take the case to trial, but were refusing to do so because they wanted more evidence. Isgit stated, quote, As far as I'm concerned, we're to the point where I'm satisfied that we either need to go forward with it or set it aside for new developments. If we can't get a murder conviction, what's the next best thing? Is it a manslaughter charge? I want to go with murder. End quote. In February of 1992, a second grand jury hearing was held, though this one failed to return any indictments. Deputy Solicitor David Schwakey made several comments regarding the way state laws currently protected spouses from being compelled to testify against one another. He also noted that the grand jury had recommended the law should be changed when it comes to the murder investigation of a child. When asked if it was specifically this law that had blocked the prosecution, Swakey told the Sumter item, quote, that's a conclusion that can be drawn from it. That invites speculation as to who may or may not be the target and who may or may not be the witness. The public and the press are going to draw some conclusions. We would certainly prosecute the case should it ever become postured so we could present enough evidence to warrant a conviction, end quote. One month later, in March of 92, three years after Justin's murder, a new law was passed which adjusted the rules regarding compelling spouses to testify. Specifically, in the case of the death or murder of a child, spouses could no longer plead the fifth and would be held in contempt of court for refusing to testify. Unfortunately, this law could do little for Justin's case as it could not be retroactively applied to any persons who had previously been charged or indicted for murder. Yet another unfortunate turn of events in a case which seems to be flush with missteps near misses and outright mistakes. That same month, Elaine Pace filed a $10 million lawsuit against the Sheriff's Department alleging they were negligent in their investigation. The lawsuit claimed that the Sheriff's Department did not properly investigate Justin's death, did not properly secure the crime scene by allowing Pamela and Buddy to continue staying in the home, and did not adequately investigate physical evidence. The Sheriff's Department argued back that Elaine had missed the deadline to file this lawsuit 
and that they had not been negligent during any part of their investigation. Six months would pass, but in September, Judge Gerald Smoke dismissed the case, noting that the state Supreme Court had ruled previously that public officials could not be held liable for using their own discretion in the performance of their public duties. Once again, Justin's case began to fall out of media headlines and another feud between departments developed. This time, the sheriff's office was in conflict with the Ninth Circuit Solicitor's Office, with Sheriff Isgit stating that he believed there was plenty of evidence to make an arrest, but he wouldn't do so because he'd been told by Deputy Solicitor Schwakey that they would not prosecute without further evidence. Justin's case again became politicized, with it being brought up in debates between candidates for the position of sheriff as well as other public posts. While some believed that investigators had bungled the case, the sheriff's office stated that they had done everything they possibly could to the point that they simply didn't have the evidence they needed. All the while, the life of an innocent, sweet, and kind child was destroyed, and the person responsible was free to move on with their life. As Elaine suffered terribly with the loss of her son, the case began growing cold. However, it was far from over. Over the course of the next few years, there was a lot of back and forth in the media, mostly between the sheriff's department and the solicitor's office. Sheriff Isgit essentially told reporters that he was washing his hands of the case. His department had done everything they could, but it was never enough for the solicitor's office, and so what else could they do? When the election came around for a new sheriff, several deputies who had worked under both Isgit and Cannon stepped up to run for the spot. During debates, Justin's case was brought up, and both Lieutenant Sidney Wren, the lead investigator, and Deputy Wayne DeWitt replied that they had worked the case hard, and sadly, there was unlikely to be a prosecution unless someone confessed. In December of 1996, Coroner William Smith Jr. passed away. A month later, in January of 97, Family members came across several files related to Justin's case while going through his belongings. At the time, there was uncertainty as to whether those files were originals, not in the possession of investigators, or if they were copies that Smith had taken home to work on the case in his free time. The documents were turned over to then-coroner Wade Arnett, who in turn contacted SLED and delivered all the files to them. Unfortunately, following the discovery of these files, Justin's case once again fell from the headlines, and the investigation appeared to have hit a wall. Sadly, on Sunday, December 26, 2004, Vivian Elaine Pace passed away at the age of 46. For 15 years, she had struggled to accept the loss of her son while fighting to ensure justice would be delivered. She tragically lost that struggle and was laid to rest in the mausoleum next to her beloved child. Later, when asked about how the murder of Justin had impacted the remaining years of her life, Russell Pace told the Post and Courier, quote, Elaine worked on trying to find out what happened to her son until the day she died. She was constantly on the phone with investigators seeing if they had any new information. She never let it go, end quote. With her last request, Elaine made Russell promise that he would not give up on Justin until the murderer was captured. Seven years later, in 2011, 22 years after Justin's murder, several newspapers ran articles discussing the case and wondering where the investigation was at after more than two decades. At the time, Sheriff Wayne DeWitt told the Post and Courier that Buddy and Pamela remained persons of interest, but to date, insufficient evidence had been found to formally charge them. Sometime in the more than 20 years that had passed, Pamela legally changed her name, and according to the sheriff, neither she nor Buddy ever contacted them. Sheriff DeWitt explained, quote, The mother called every day, but we never heard one word from the father. Not once has he called over the past 22 years to inquire about his son's murder or where we are in the investigation. End quote. Russell Pace was interviewed by WCSC News 5, and asked about why he believed no arrests had ever been made. In his opinion, the investigation was handled poorly from the get-go, and it was due to those early mistakes that justice had been evaded. Russell explained, quote, 
From what we understand, things were lost, things were contaminated, too many people were involved, not enough leadership at the time. Justin's constantly in my memory. End quote. When asked about his and Elaine's involvement in the case over the years and potential suspects, Russell replied, quote, Elaine and I have always been right here. Whenever investigators needed something, we were always right here and available. We didn't move away. We didn't change our names. End quote. 2014 marked 25 years since Justin's murder, and still, there didn't appear to be any new developments. Several new pieces of information emerged around this time, though what weight they truly carry versus speculation has never been solidified. One accusation going around a lot in 1989, but not discussed much in the years since, was that Pamela either had a family member involved in the investigation or possibly was having a romantic affair with an officer. This rumor reportedly made Elaine struggle when it came to trusting investigators who she thought might have been working alongside someone with a reason to protect Pamela. When Lieutenant Wren was asked about this, he told the Berkeley Observer, quote, I would never even try to recognize such a statement as that because it's not true. I don't know of anyone she was connected with like that. I know because I was the lead investigator and there's no way I would have let that happen under any circumstances, end quote. While Lieutenant Wren disagreed with that rumor, there was one piece of information he decided to share which hadn't been publicly stated previously. Perhaps after the passage of a quarter century, there wasn't nearly as much need to keep it a secret anymore. Lieutenant Wren believed that Justin's murder was committed not because of something he had done, which led to someone violently lashing out, but perhaps due to something he knew that he wasn't supposed to know. In 2016, Wren told the Berkeley Observer that Elaine spoke to Justin on the phone every night before bed, and this included the night before his disappearance. According to Wren, the conversation the two shared that night suggested that Justin had seen or knew something that Pamela didn't want him telling anyone. Wren explained the call, saying, quote, He told his mother, Mama, I've got something really important to tell you when you pick me up. Well, the stepmother took the phone out of his hand and wouldn't let him talk anymore. End quote. What exactly Justin may have known has never been made clear, but Wren felt strongly that the child's murder was committed in order to keep him quiet. When discussing issues with the case, Lieutenant Wren noted that they were fighting an uphill battle from the beginning. Media coverage and consistent leaks from insider sources hampered their ability to conceal information from any suspects, making the interrogations more complicated. During this interview, Wren also makes the claim that he had specifically requested that Coroner William Smith not get involved and call an inquest, which contradicts statements he made at the time where he'd originally argued they'd asked Smith to hold an inquest, but he wouldn't. When discussing Coroner Smith, Wren stated, quote, the coroner at the time was only 21 years old. I asked Smith to let me handle the investigation and don't do anything until I completed it. I brought him in my office. He acted like he had no problems with that. But the very next day, the news media comes out with coroner calls big inquest. He screwed it all to hell. He was doing everything to make the sheriff's office look bad. I was going to need the real mother, Elaine, to help me connect the evidence that Victor's mother had been providing me with. She refused to talk to me. She was mad as hell because the coroner had messed up her mind. End quote. When asked who he believed had been responsible for Justin's murder, Wren wouldn't give a name, though he specified there was no doubt in anyone's mind who had been the killer. Directly asked about Pamela, Wren stated that she lied multiple times during the initial polygraph and that she refused to cooperate with the investigation. When discussing Buddy, Wren talked of how his own mother had tried to help detectives, saying, quote, I had Victor's mother go to him and get him by himself to talk to him in detail to get him to come forward. By this time, we knew what went on, but she had something over his damn head so that he wouldn't say anything. What it was, I'm not sure. End quote. That same year, Justin's family reached out to Berkeley County, hoping to reinvigorate the case and find out where exactly it stood. 
Denise Finley and Amy Parsons, Justin's cousins, remember the horrible circumstances surrounding his death, and with his mother and grandparents gone, they believe it's their responsibility to continue the fight for justice. The group was able to visit the sheriff and discuss the case, with Amy explaining, quote, I was very pleased with the meeting. It's the first opportunity that we've had in many years to meet with the sheriff. They currently have a new set of eyes looking at the case, and we're hoping to maybe pursue some things. End quote. Following Justin's murder, Elaine had given birth to a son she and Russell named Cody. While Cody never had the chance to meet his half-brother, he learned a great deal about him through his mother, and over the course of those years, he saw how much pain his mother had gone through. Asked about the impact Justin's murder had on Elaine, and on Cody himself, he replied, quote, It's been very hard for everybody. When she was dying, one of her last wishes was to have my dad pursue the case. So even as she was there dying, it was on her mind consuming her. Looking back, she was miserable. It's always going to be on my mind until something happens, because that was my mom. She didn't get closure. It affected her relationship with my dad a lot. I just don't understand how someone can live with this for so long and not say anything. I just don't understand how they can live with themselves. End quote. In September of 2020, it was announced that Justin's murder was one of nine cases being re-examined by the cold case unit. Out of the nine cases, Justin's file is by far the thickest and most extensive, with simultaneously the largest amount of evidence, but not definitive enough evidence to make an arrest. Sheriff Dwayne Lewis told the Post and Courier that in 2019, investigators had met and spoken with Buddy and Pamela, though he wouldn't go into detail about what exactly was said. In regard to the new investigation, Sheriff Lewis stated that the original crime scene photos and autopsy photos had gone missing in the early 2000s, but they found them in Alaska. Apparently, a former investigator had sent the files to a forensics expert, but had never followed through or requested their return. Having the original photos allowed detectives to examine the evidence through a sharper lens, and it was determined that Justin had likely been killed with an object consistent with a dog leash. Beyond the photos, it was decided that, considering updates in technology, evidence should be re-examined in hopes they might find something. Sheriff Lewis stated that 70 pieces of evidence had been sent to SLED headquarters in Columbia for new testing, and that at least one piece of equipment being used is the MVAC, a sterile wet vacuum that can draw out DNA material previously considered too small to collect. Lieutenant Kokinda of the Cold Case Unit explained, quote, Samples that were submitted a couple of years ago that may have a negative profile or partial profile now, with more sensitive testing, might develop a profile. End quote. It's been 32 years since five-year-old Justin Lee Turner was murdered and sexually assaulted. If alive today, Justin would be turning 38. Who knows what life he could have built for himself, how his life might have dramatically changed the direction of his mother's and his family's, and what losses and pains might have been avoided had someone not chosen to violently strangle and assault the young boy. Still, after all this time, while much of Justin's family and the investigators who worked the case have passed away, justice remains just out of reach. Hopefully, through new technology, the answers will be found. One thing is for certain, Justin's family have no intention of forgetting, nor will they give up. Well, that is most of his family, outside of two people who in 30 years have never picked up the phone to ask if the investigation was even still ongoing. Before passing away in 2004, Elaine implored her family to continue the fight. It was her dying wish, and 17 years later that fight is nowhere near over. So long as a monster is free to walk the earth while Justin was taken away before his life even got a chance to start, justice has not been served. Asked about the case 25 years later, Russell Pace explained, quote, It's been hard to believe the person who did it can live their life for 25 years and knowing and thinking they got away with it. It's mind-boggling. I promised my wife before she passed away that I would continue the battle. She told me not to give up, 
keep it in the news. Just fight the battle for her. That was one of her last requests. A five-year-old boy disappears on the way to the bus stop, a short walk from the front door of his house. Hours pass, and no one knows that he's missing. Other children assumed he was homesick, while his stepmother says she thought he'd gone to school. When the afternoon bus came through the neighborhood, everyone was accounted for, except Justin Turner. At 3.12 p.m., a 911 call is placed, kicking off an investigation, which over the course of the next 48 hours will dramatically change shape when Justin's body is discovered in a trailer on his family's property, a trailer which has supposedly already been searched. Authorities determined that Justin had been strangled as well as sexually assaulted. Initially, police believe the suspect has to be someone from the outside, someone who abducted the child during his walk. However, as evidence mounts, the stranger theory is disregarded, and instead, investigators believe the suspect had to have been someone Justin knew someone who likely knew and was close to the family. Through the investigation, questions begin to arise about those closest to Justin, with detectives taking a hard look at his father, Victor, also known as Buddy, and his stepmother, Pamela. By the end of the year, Pamela is officially arrested and charged. Two months later, a grand jury returns an indictment for the murder of Justin Turner. However, while it appeared a trial would finally be able to sort through the evidence and reveal what happened, all charges are dropped, with a lack of sufficient evidence being cited as the reason. Internal disputes are leaked to the media showing the sheriff's department and then coroner William Smith were clashing over the way to proceed. Sources tell the media about evidence investigators hope to keep under wraps, forcing a media blackout from the sheriff's department. Later, after the election of a new sheriff, a new clash erupts, this time between the sheriff's department and the solicitor's office. While then-Sheriff Ray Isgit believed enough evidence existed for an arrest and trial, Deputy Solicitor David Schwakey disagreed. Just as quickly as Justin's case had captured headlines and the attention of an entire state, the stories begin to fade. Coverage drops off. A few blurbs here, an article there. As the investigation itself seemingly stalls at a dead end, where the decision has to be made to continue digging or to wait and see what else develops. All the while, Justin's mother Elaine suffers the pain and grief of losing her beloved son as his father and stepmother move out of town with the latter changing her name, seemingly in an attempt to distance herself from the case. Over the course of the next 14 years, Elaine calls every day wanting to know what's happening with her son's case. She fought to keep his name in the headlines, to keep investigators on track, to find justice for the five-year-old until she herself passed away. In the meantime, neither Buddy nor Pamela ever makes a single phone call to check in with police, to get updated about the investigation, to fight for justice, to fight for Justin. 32 years later, things remain much as they have been for the previous three decades. Only one suspect has ever been named, that being Pamela Turner. A lot of debate broke out over the years with police accused of negligence and conducting a poor investigation. There were rumors that a connection between Pamela and someone in the sheriff's department interfered with the case, an accusation the lead investigator denies, but the damage had already been done. Investigators claim to have searched a trailer, but a polygraph calls much of that into question, while polygraphs are given to Pamela and Buddy, and they're ruled inconclusive due to each allegedly taking Valium in order to skew the results. The crime scene wasn't protected until after Justin was found, while in the prior 48 hours, dozens if not hundreds of people had been everywhere participating in the search. What evidence was found answered some questions. Justin had been murdered the day he vanished, likely within hours of when he was reported missing. Forensic examinations conclude that he couldn't have been stored in a freezer or even moved after his death, but had been hidden in the storage compartment beneath the trailer seat while hundreds of people were scouring the neighborhood in search of him. In the end, it was Justin's own father who discovered his body, leading many to wonder if he'd always known or perhaps had been told where to find him. Then statements from a neighbor's son, six years old at the time, throw another wrench into the investigation. This witness claims to have seen Justin's abduction, allegedly perpetrated by an older man who grabbed the child and whisked him away to a waiting car. While police do find one person who fits the description, 
His alibi clears him of involvement, and the witness is subjected to psychological examinations. In the end, two out of three psychiatrists believe the witness had been influenced by news coverage, while one suggests the level of trauma the child experienced more than likely supports his claims. Police are advised to back off, as further questioning might increase his traumatization, and in the end, he couldn't stand up to cross-examination in a trial setting anyway. In all reality, though, investigators already had their prime suspect, and they never found much to dissuade them from believing they knew exactly who the killer was. Unfortunately, they never get the evidence they need to directly tie the suspect to the murder, with many calling it circumstantial at best. I know what you're thinking. I've read the comments and emails I've gotten since posting part one. Everyone believed the answer lies with Pamela, and I fully admit it's difficult to not be heavily swayed by what evidence does exist. That combined with what I can only call bizarre or evasive behavior in the days and weeks after the murder makes it pretty clear who's most likely responsible, and it wasn't a stranger. Cases like this are exceedingly frustrating when you have a good idea of who likely committed the crime, but it can't be proven. Factor in the murder and sexual assault of a child, and it's difficult not to be full of anger and rage. Only a monster could do something like this, and yet, in this case, that monster has walked free for 32 years. I've had people ask me why I do cases like this. Why bother when we pretty much know what happened? Well, it's pretty simple. This isn't about finding the most confusing and complicated mystery. It's about bringing attention to cases that need it. Cases where even the slightest piece of information could sway everything. Who knows what someone might have been biting their tongue on for the past 32 years? Who knows what someone might have seen or heard in the days leading up to the murder or the years after? You never know what key might be necessary to unlock the mystery, and while everyone believes they know who committed the crime and says so with a sense of self-satisfaction, that does little to provide justice for Justin Turner or his family. It's sort of the same way people often tell me they don't like when I cover cases involving children. I get that. These are the hardest episodes to research and write. But I've always seen it as, if they had to suffer through this, the least I can do is try and make sure no one forgets. I don't expect everyone to listen. I don't expect everyone to be in a position where they can go through this horrible nightmare without feeling heavy grief and anguish. But whether it's 50,000 or 2,000 people hearing the story, that's 2,000 more people than knew about it yesterday. I don't envision myself as some detective who's going to solve these cases. I'm not out there trying to make arrests. I'm telling the story and hoping that maybe, somewhere out there, it finds someone who either remembers something or decides that after all these years, it's time to speak up. Justin's family wants justice, they want answers, they want the truth, and they want to see Justin's killer behind bars. And they deserve to have all of that. The last real confirmation we have of Justin being alive seems to be the night before his disappearance. According to Lieutenant Wren, Justin spoke to his mother Elaine on the phone the night of Thursday, March 2nd. Sometime during that conversation, Justin apparently mentioned wanting to tell Elaine something, and before he could, the phone was taken away. The only other statement we have about Justin following this comes from Pamela. According to her testimony, she was showering at approximately 11 a.m. on Friday, March 3rd, when Justin popped in to say he was going to school. Normally, she walked him to the bus stop, but for whatever reason, she showered instead. I know we have the witness who claims to have seen Justin that morning, but we'll get into that later. So, according to the investigation, Justin disappeared sometime on the morning of the 3rd prior to 11 a.m., While there's a chance something could have happened to him between the evening of the 2nd and the morning of the 3rd, his time of death was narrowed to have been between 10 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. on Friday. This was based on forensic examinations specifically related to the last food Justin was known to have eaten, a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch. While this is obviously a range, I do find it interesting that Justin could have been killed as early as an hour before Pamela last reported seeing him alive. It's in this time frame that a lot of questions about this case remain unanswered. Outside of the one witness described as being a six-year-old boy, no one else in the area saw Justin that morning. None of the children or parents at the bus stop saw him coming out of his house or walking towards the bus stop, 
So it seems safe to assume that whatever happened to him, it either happened in that house or somewhere between the front door and the end of the driveway. If we look at the six-year-old's eyewitness statements, he claims Justin walked down the driveway, at which time an older male called out to him. Justin approached, the man grabbed him, pulling him away to a waiting vehicle. I suppose the primary problem with this statement is, if Justin was abducted, why would the killer have brought him back? It's never made any sense to me that someone would abduct Justin, kill him, sexually assault him, and then return him to his family's property, putting him inside the storage space in the trailer without anyone noticing. Even if he had done this in the four-hour window between 11 a.m. and 3.12 when police are notified, he'd be running a hell of a risk by returning to the scene carrying Justin's body. I also think it's worth noting that typically, when a child is sexually assaulted through the use of an object, this can be a clue towards the perpetrator. Were this to have been done by a pedophile, the likelihood of using an object leans towards either a sadistic killer or perhaps someone who lacks the ability to physically manifest the arousal necessary to commit the act. This is also why, oftentimes, the use of an object is in connection to a child perpetrator or a female assailant. There's obviously a level of control and dominance involved, and perhaps even an attempt by the suspect to shame the victim. However, I think in Justin's case, it might be a sign of something else. Forensic examinations were never able to determine whether or not Justin had been assaulted prior to or after his death. Apparently, the two attacks occurred so closely together that no one could actually narrow that down. I also think based on the fact that the object has only ever been referred to as cylindrical and investigators never noted actually having it, the killer must have taken it with them or discarded it afterwards. One theory would be that the killer believed the object would identify them, and assuming they weren't wearing gloves, they were probably right. The question for me, however, is, was this sexual assault conducted due to the desires of the killer? Or was it something done to throw off investigators, to make them believe the killer had a sexual attraction to children in order to narrow that pool down to known sexual offenders? I also think it's worth noting that when Justin's body was found, Sheriff Cannon stated that he was partially dressed, his pants having been described as being pulled about three quarters of the way down his legs. Why leave him in this state of partial undress unless the killer was either in a major rush and didn't have time, or felt like they didn't have time, to pull his pants back up? Or maybe they wanted to make sure the coroner would look closely for signs of sexual assault. To me, it's always felt like the sexual assault was an after-the-fact decision, something strategically done to influence the investigation. But there's also the chance that this sexual assault was being performed as some kind of punishment, and the reaction to it led the killer to go further, strangling the child to death. Perhaps this had been done to silence his cries, or as profilers apparently determined, out of both anger and frustration. Being that no evidence of prior sexual assaults was found, I tend to lean towards this being a strategic act rather than one which led to the murder as a secondary choice, but that's purely my speculation. When Justin was found, there was a lot of confusion. How did everyone who searched the trailer miss him? One detective said he searched everywhere, but Justin wasn't in there. He later failed a polygraph. Another noted he'd searched the trailer, but hadn't looked inside the compartment because he didn't know it was there. Pamela's mother claimed to have been present when a detective went through the trailer, opening every drawer and cabinet, but none of the investigators ever supported that statement. Look, I know we can't say anything with 100% certainty, but I think it's a hell of a lot more likely that Justin was in that trailer the entire time. I can't imagine what kind of a suspect would abduct him, assault him, murder him, and then bring him back to the scene. It's a completely unnecessary risk, and there are plenty of wooded and vacant areas around where Justin was where he could have been left, possibly not to have been found for days, weeks, or even years. To me, Justin died somewhere on the property where he lived and never left it on Friday, March 3rd. One key piece of information which has never been established is motive. But I also think seeking motive in this case is suggesting the existence of premeditation, and I'm not sure that's a part of this. If the profilers are correct and the murder occurred as the result of anger and frustration, it sounds more like something that happened spur of the moment, rather than a cold and calculated act planned out in advance. 
Of course, that somewhat conflicts with the idea of sexually assaulting Justin in an attempt to throw off detectives, unless that too was spur of the moment, or perhaps happened prior to the murder, which in and of itself might have been reactionary. In a case like this, you're always going to focus in on the parents, and in this case, there's four. Two biological parents, Elaine and Victor, and then the step-parents, Russell and Pamela. Russell and Elaine were both at work when the crime occurred, and beyond that, both loved Justin and were actually working to obtain custody of him. It doesn't make a great deal of sense that in the midst of this, one of them would travel to Monk's Corner, snatch Justin, assault him, murder him, and then sneak him into the trailer without anyone noticing. Two days after Justin was found, Pamela and Buddy were taken down to Sled Headquarters, questioned for four hours and polygraphed. According to Buddy's own mother, her son told her that during questioning, investigators accused Pamela of the crime and Buddy of helping to cover it up. He was at work the morning Justin disappeared. Now, if you've listened to this show for any period of time, you know I'm not a huge proponent of polygraph tests. They're unreliable to such a degree that they're not admissible in court. Now, if they'd each taken the test and failed or the results had come out inconclusive, I wouldn't think much about it. The problem here is there was seemingly a calculated attempt to disrupt the results by taking Valium. I think it's important to note there's not a solid answer in regard to whether or not a sedative such as Valium will affect the results of the polygraph. Or more accurately, there's some evidence to suggest it could affect the results, but not that it can be used to help cheat the test. Valium will have an impact on heart rate and respiration, which are measured during the polygraph. And while it doesn't seem like simply taking a pill can make a lie seem legitimate, most studies have shown the presence of drugs in the system will result in inconclusive tests. According to investigators, Pamela admitted to having taken Valium and was asked to take the test again without taking the pill. She agreed, but her lawyer put a stop to that. Instead, an outside company was hired to polygraph the couple, and according to their testimony, each passed when asked if they had killed Justin. Of course, I haven't found any information about any blood or urine tests conducted at that point to show whether or not they had taken any substances prior to the second test. At the end of the day, I think it means a lot less to say they passed or didn't pass. It's more important to me that there was apparently an attempt made to do something before the test which could alter the results. It doesn't scream innocence to me when someone would willingly do that. We don't have the full details of how that conversation went down, though. Did someone admit to taking Valium specifically to alter the test, or did they simply admit to having been on Valium that day? Did Pamela have a prescription for it, or was it from an outside source? I'd imagine most defense attorneys could make an argument that, in the wake of Justin's murder, the Valium was being used to help with grief. Legitimate or not, I don't think there's much we can do with this information, but it sure helps sway your opinion, doesn't it? After hiring lawyers, Buddy and Pamela are fairly uncooperative. They won't answer any questions that don't go through their lawyers, they won't take a polygraph at sled headquarters, and when the first coroner's inquest is called, each pleads the fifth rather than testifying. When the second inquest begins, neither shows up for the first two days. Now, this may have been due to paperwork getting lost in the mail. They'd recently moved to Spartanburg. But you'd also have to believe that their lawyer wasn't contacted, and they weren't watching the news or reading any newspapers during the weeks leading up to this. When they do show up for the third day, they again plead the fifth and refuse to answer any questions under the advice of their lawyers. Just think about that for a moment. Take Pamela out of the equation. Just look at Victor. Your five-year-old son was sexually assaulted and strangled before being stuffed into the storage space inside of your own camper, and you won't answer questions under oath? Does that sound like a father desperate to get to the bottom of the case? I think now is a good time to address the Fifth Amendment. With Pamela clearly being the prime suspect at the time of the inquest, pleading the Fifth somewhat makes sense. But I do think it's worth noting that the Fifth Amendment is invoked because people have a right against self-incrimination. Essentially, if you did something wrong, you can't be forced to admit that in court. That's the prosecutor's job. They have to prove it. However, it isn't purely limited to answering a question that would directly incriminate you. 
The fifth can also be used to protect a person from providing information which could lead to the discovery of incriminating evidence. So the question here would be, if Pamela was taking the fifth under the possibility of protecting herself from incrimination, was Buddy pleading the fifth in order to not have to provide information which could be used to prove Pamela's guilt? If Buddy didn't directly commit the crime, then he has no risk of self-incrimination. However, if he either committed the crime or participated in an attempt to cover it up, then he would need to plead the fifth. The Fifth Amendment is kind of one of those catch-22 situations, though. While it's well within your rights as an American citizen to invoke the Fifth, it also tends to make people think you're either guilty or know more about a crime than you've been sharing simply because you invoked it. The argument would often be, if you've got nothing to hide, then you shouldn't have to worry. In this case, though, there's other levels to it. Both Buddy and Pamela invoke the Fifth at the coroner's inquest, which has different rules and is open to public scrutiny. Everything said during the inquest is available to the public. However, grand jury proceedings are sealed, and only those present know what is or is not stated during testimony. I think it's interesting to note that both Pamela and Buddy requested to testify before the grand jury. I also think it's worth noting that that first grand jury returned an indictment for murder. In the years following Justin's murder, while Elaine and Russell worked to keep the case in the headlines, they maintained close contact with police. Elaine called every day to ask if there was anything new, and if investigators ever needed anything from her, she was right there willing to help in any way she could. Buddy and Pamela, not so much. Pamela went on to legally change her name, and while it wasn't difficult to discover the identity she goes by now, I'm not going to give it out here. I will, however, note that both Buddy and Pamela are currently listed as living at the same residence, so apparently, 32 years later, they're still together. According to investigators, over the past three decades, they've never once picked up the phone and called to ask any questions. On the one hand, you might argue, well, Pamela was slash is a suspect, so why would she call? But I find it difficult to believe that Buddy has no interest. To me, that either means one of three things. He doesn't call because his wife is more important, or because he knows the truth, or because he just doesn't care. This may be one of the most frustrating cases I've ever covered. Everything seems to point in one direction, but apparently not strongly enough to have any legal action taken. While one side of the family fights to this day to find justice, the other side moved on with their lives and seemingly never looked back. Errors in the investigation led to the inability to move forward properly. Lies on all sides of the equation complicated the situation far more. And in the end, we've got a five-year-old murdered, sexually assaulted, forced into a storage bin in a camper found on the third day of a search by his own father. How many quotes did you hear during these past two episodes that I attributed to Buddy or Pamela outside of pleading the fifth? None because I couldn't find a single interview, blog post, Facebook comment, nothing that ever mentions Justin, the case, or a desire for justice. Nothing I have presented to you over the course of the past two hours can be wielded in court to find someone guilty beyond the shadow of a doubt by a jury of their peers. There's a hell of a lot of circumstantial evidence, enough to make everyone believe they know the answers. They know who committed this crime. Unfortunately, if you took it to court today, you'd have maybe a 50-50 chance of actually getting a conviction. All I can really say is, if this was my son, my face would be everywhere. There'd be signs up all over the state. I'd be doing interviews at every chance that I had and fighting to keep his name alive until the killer was found. I've never met Justin Turner. I would have been six at the time he was killed. I never knew his family. I never got to see his smile or hear his laugh. So why in the hell in two hours have I said exponentially more about this case than his own father ever has? 32 years ago, someone committed a heinous act. They brutally strangled a five-year-old boy, sexually assaulted him, left his pants down, and stuffed him into the storage space beneath a bench seat in an old, rusted, and broken-down camper trailer. Then... They just went on with their life like nothing happened. No burden of regret, no ache of remorse. 
just living life however they want, knowing that a child died and a family was shattered because of what they did. While the family continues to fight and investigators do everything they can to finally bring justice, without new evidence, some new discovery from today's forensic technology, or someone finally coming forward with the truth, the murder of Justin Lee Turner will remain open, unsolved, and cold. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Justin Turner, there are many news articles discussing his case. Most specifically helpful was the Greenville News, Index Journal, Post and Courier, and the Berkeley Observer. There is also a Facebook page entitled Justice for Justin Turner, which is run by his family and has a lot of additional information on the case, links to news articles, pictures of Justin, and so much more. If you have any information about the murder of Justin Turner, please contact the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office at 843-719-4465. You can also contact Crime Stoppers at 843-554-1111. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod. Message me on Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod, email me at Trace Evidence Pod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Trace Evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Aurora Kay, Bacon Bits the Cat. Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dave Allen, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eric Sumpter, Guillerme Pinto, Heather Louise, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kara Moreland, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakizen. Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levonen, Sarah Mascaratolo, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skeptko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, Tracy Woods, and Walter Jansen. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash traceevidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. If you haven't already, please consider rating the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Five stars would be greatly appreciated, but it's up to you. Share these episodes, spread the word, and maybe together we can help bring justice to those who have been deprived of it. Thank you all once again for listening, supporting the show, and for being the best listeners a podcaster could ask for. I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.